Hello YouTube, it's Barbara Jean. Um, I don't know how to start this video. Um, I've had some really rough days the last couple of weeks. Really rough. And um, um, I would really, really, really appreciate your prayers right now. I'm really struggling with something. And it has to do with, I'm certain it has to do with the Grace Church has to do with, I'm, I'm feeling it all in here, on my upper chest, my throat area, and I've been really struggling emotionally, spiritually. Um, what's been coming up is, I feel like I'm, I've been fighting the spirit of death. I know it sounds dramatic, but it's, it's how I've been feeling. Like I've been really feeling, I just want to go home. <laughs> I'm tired of the struggle. I just, right now, I'm just really really hard pressed and uh, uh, doing a lot of crying and a lot of crying out to God and so I could appreciate would we would appreciate your prayers very much um, and in this matter I'm feeling it like I said right up in here in this area of my, my, my body and I've been as you know I've had some dreams about my friend Grace, who represents the Grace Church. I had a dream about her this morning, too. I, I When I woke up, I realized I had a dream, and it was actually not a bad dream. It was actually quite a... It was it was a fun dream, as, as far as dreams go. It wasn't heavy or dark or anything. It was actually quite uplifting and fun. But I, I at this moment, I can't remember it. I do, just when I woke up, I realized, oh, I had another dream about Grace, which is strange, because I haven't had hardly any dreams about her at all and all of a sudden in the last little while she's been on my mind I suppose or uh, the situation that's been going on in the church about the Grace Church and how we're, she's struggling and and, uh, and I've been feel like I said I've been feeling like I've been struggling with the spirit of death let me just read about the Grace Church this is Revelation chapter 3 she's the church that appears before the Church of Philadelphia Revelation chapter 3 she starts at verse 1 and unto the angel of the church of Sardis, write these things, ye that has the seven spirits of God. And the seven star, stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If thou hast, if that, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I come unto thee. <sighs> Excuse me. Thou hast a few names, even in stars, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name in the book of life. But I will confess his name before, before my father and before his angels. This is interesting. Um... um he talks a lot. Let me see how many times it talks about. Uh, talks about garments here at least twice here. He says. Uh, Which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white. So we're talking about white garments. They've not defiled their garments and they'll walk with me in white. He that overcometh shall be clothed in white raiment. So he mentions clothing at least three times here in this passage. And it's about righteousness. Um, but it's also, a, there's a spirit of death on this church. Uh, that thou hast a name that thou art livest and art dead. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, but thou livest and art dead. So this church has a spirit of death on it. Interesting. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, for, that are ready to die. Uh, this is really interesting because like I said, last, uh, since I've had this dream about grace, the last time I told you I had this dream, even before that, before I had the dream about grace, 
this sense that I'm struggling with the spirit of death and it's been really, really hard. And I'm in the last couple of days, I've been really struggling with it, really just crying out to the Lord, weeping and saying, Lord, I just can't deal with this. You've got to help me because I can't do this. I can't do this. This is too much for me. And I've really been feeling like I've been struggling with the spirit of death. And I have been for the last, at least the last 10 years, at least. At least the last 10 years when I've been, since this all started, and and then, uh, you know, to, what was it, through 2010, and all this really, really began, this all started to come down on me, and the spirit of prophecy and all this came on me, it was, it's been hard. Um, and then, uh, it was the first 2010, I think it was started in 2010, and maybe even before that, um, I felt this anointing. Uh, I think it started in 2009, this continued feeling of oil. Like I'd, I'd get the sensation that oil was being poured on my head, and it, would, it was so strange, because that's what it just felt like. Just like it feels like I'm having brain surgery now, it felt like someone was pouring oil on my head. And it was this continual dripping down my, my face, and it was very strange. And then in 2010, when this revelation happened and the Lord came to me, the Spirit of the Lord came to me and, and, um, and unbeknownst to me, I accepted an assignment from him, not knowing the extent of what it was going to be. I had no idea that it would be to this extent. And the anointing just kept continuing, but only more so, the sensation of oil being poured on my head. And then in 2011, I started, or 2010, 2011, I started the YouTube channel, the YouTube. And then it was the year after when the anointing changed from the sensation of oil being poured on my head to this brain surgery. And then that's when all, it seems like all hell break, broke loose and my body, everything just started to fall to pieces. I literally almost overnight, my legs swelled up, my feet swelled up pain, uh, incredible amounts of pain all throughout my body, especially my legs, terrible things going on. And it was, I thought I was going to die then. I should have, I felt like death then. I felt like the spirit of death had already descended on me then. And yet here I am still all these years later, and a few hospital visits and all the rest of it. Uh, here I am a few years later. The Lord spoke to me last night after I was really struggling and crying out to the Lord saying, you know, Lord, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I'm just, I'm tired. I'm really tired. I, I, I can't live with this any more longer. You've got to deal with this because this is too much for me. I can't deal with this, especially this, I guess this last bit and having to do with the spirit of death and the spirit of the grace church, the grace church, I'm really struggling with that. Of all the things I've had to deal with, I think this has been probably been the hardest. Uh, strange of all the things I've had to deal with this has been really 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 hard and as you can imagine the spirit of death is hard not easy to overcome and uh, this church has a spirit of death on it because it's because of its uncleanness and um, but it's that uh, we have to overcome it we have to defeat the spirit of death and that's on this church and like I said, the Lord did speak to me and said that he, of course, was with me and he would never leave me nor forsake me like he always does. And that uh, I'm going to get through this. It's going to be tough, yeah. And it is tough. But we will we will persevere. Um, just hold on, hold on, hold fast. And this is what it says here. Hold on and hold fast. It says, um, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. So we're supposed to hold fast and repent. Uh, so this is like I said, this is this has been a real, a really tough one for me. But like I said, I did have a dream of grace last night. Another good dream about grace. So the Lord is doing a work in the Grace Church. He really is working hard on the Grace Church right now, and maybe that's why I'm feeling it, he's, uh, he's dealing with this spirit of death that's on this church, 
and that I've been feeling for the last you know, nine, ten years of my life, the last ten years of my life. It's been terrible, awful feeling. It just seems like it's coming to the surface. Anyway, enough of that. Oh, I'm still struggling with it. I'm still struggling with it. And uh, I'll let you know how it pans out, because right now I'm just, you know, it's, it's hard. It's been hard. Uh, anyway, other things I've been thinking about. Uh, this may not be um, popular with people, what I'm going to say next. Uh, but some things I've been thinking about, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, still trying to sort out some things between the Church of Laodicea, the Bride of Christ, the Church of Philadelphia. I'm still trying to work out some things in my mind about. Um, some revelation the Lord gave me and he gave me this revelation actually back in 2000 back in 2000 and, and uh, 9 2010 2010 <clears throat> when uh, the Lord did approach me for this prophetic ministry this prophetic experience that I've been going under he said something to me, and I've told you this before, something he said to me, but it's been coming to my mind a lot lately. As I've been thinking about the Church of Laodicea, the Bride of Christ, uh, her relationship to the Church of Laodicea, I've been, in that passage back in, um, I think it was Luke, Luke chapter, about the woman, Luke chapter 7, the sinful woman, and she's forgiven, and this is Christ at the, um, at this dinner that this Pharisee, Simon, had given, was given on Jesus' behalf, but didn't treat him with honor that he, des that he deserved as a um, honored guest. He didn't treat him with the honor that he was due, and this is the Pharisee. He didn't anoint Jesus' head with oil, which was the, I guess, the practice of the day. Uh, um, you know, or, or basically, you know, putting, giving him some pomade, I guess, and so he can comb his hair. Um, he didn't wash his feet or have the, give him the ability to clean his feet before he started dinner, because in those days, I mean, there's, you know, in those desert areas and dusty areas, when you're wearing sandals, your feet are dirty, and the last, the last thing you would be as comfortable as, lying, you know, sitting on a, on a, on a dinner sofa, which is what they would do. They would lounge on these sofas and eat. Um, your feet wouldn't be very comfortable, so the, the courtesy would be to have him wash his feet, but he didn't do that. And he didn't greet him with a holy kiss. He, uh, But this woman, this sinful woman who comes to Jesus and she brings an expensive alabaster box full of ointments, and she anoints his feet and washes his feet with her tears and wipes his feet with her hair. And this this contrast between these two people, Simon and uh, this Pharisee and uh, this woman. <coughs> Excuse me. Just a moment. Sorry about that. I had problems with my sinuses. Sneezing and coughing and all the rest of it. It has to do with the Grace Church. It's not very real. Sinuses on this area. It just shows you. Anyway. Um. And Jesus talks to Simon about this: these two debtors, one who owes a little and one who owes a lot. And the one who, he says, it's interesting, he talks to this Pharisee about money. So, because he knew that Simon understood money, being a Pharisee and his obsession with money. Um, so he talks to him about money and uh, about how one, if one owes him a great deal and compared to another, but they're both forgiven, who loves more? And Simon said, well, of course, the one who owes the most loves more, loves the one who sets him free from the debt. And so then Jesus says to the woman that her her sins are forgiven. And uh, anyway, you can read the whole passage yourself. It's uh, Luke 7, starting at verse 36. And 
and uh, like I said, it's a very ironic passage because the reality is that Simon, who was a Pharisee, <laughs> really was the one who needs to be, who's being forgiven much, more than this woman. She's being forgiven much, yes, but he is also being being forgiven more, but he doesn't he doesn't perceive that. So it's quite ironic this whole passage, but it's also very prophetic. It's a prophetic passage about the bride and the church of Laodicea. Um, um, going back to Revelation chapter 3, I'm going to jump around here. I'm really, I'm really thinking out loud here, people, so just stay with me. Um, church of Laodicea, the church of Philadelphia, is the church that is not judged for their works. Of all the churches, it's the only church that's not judged for its work. However, there was a weakness in this church because they are the Church of Philadelphia. They haven't yet learned agape. And I told you about that. The perfect is the agape. When Peter, who represents the Church of Philadelphia, when Jesus came to him and said to him, Do you love me, Peter? Do you agape me, Peter? And he said, No, Lord, I phileo. I phileo Philadelphia. My love for you is brotherhood, brother, brotherly love. And... And Jesus said, do you agape me, Peter? And he said a third, second time, I phileo you, Lord. And he asked him the third time, he said, do you phileo me, Peter? And Peter said, yes, I phileo you, Lord. So this is interesting. This is all tied in with this whole scenario. But the Lord says in Corinthians chapter 13, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, the perfect is the agape. The perfect is agape, the way of love. 1 Corinthians 13, and you read the whole passage, and it talks about how, how, what, what uh, true love is. Now, obviously, Christ, when he was talking to Peter, was looking for agape. But Peter could only offer phileo. Okay? Now, perfect love, what that's described in 1 Corinthians 13, when you get, you get to the... The translation of what love is, which is called described here as charity in this in this, this um, in this passage or in this uh, translation. But it is actually agape. First Corinthians 13 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth itself not. But when you look at the translation, it's actually agape. The agape love. The perfect love. And when, it, when you read down to the bottom, and it says, uh, the passage says, uh, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. What is the perfect? Well, he's talking about love. The perfect, the perfect love. Okay? It, it's the only thing that makes sense. When I was growing up, there was this... Um, People who were, you know, used to teach, you know, in our church, and they would say, well, from what they are understood and from what they were taught, the perfect refers to the scriptures. When the scriptures come, then that which we know in part will be done away with, which doesn't really make any sense because it's not talking about the scriptures here. It's talking about love. The subject is love. The whole subject of this whole passage is about charity or love, the agape. So what is the imperfect? The imperfect is the phileo. The phileo love, or any other kind of love, is imperfect. The perfect love is agape, and that's what it's referring to. It makes sense. So when the perfect comes, then that which is, that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, even though as a child as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For we see now through a glass darkly, so we know in part. But then we then face to face, now, now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity or agape. So the perfect is the agape. So this is what the Lord is looking for from his church. Going back to Revelation chapter 3, the Church of Philadelphia, 
the Church of Philadelphia is the Church of Brotherly Love. It's the Phileo Church. It's the church that has learned to love its brethren. But it's also the church that has been, these are baptized believers, and like I said, I've proven that using the scriptures, using the scriptures as backup, that this is the church. The reason why they're not judged for their works is because they are in Christ through baptism. That's Romans 6. We have we've been put to death our our own works our own self righteousness we put that to death so there's no judgment for our for, on us all the other churches are judged according to their works not saying that they're saved according to their works there's a difference there's a difference I'm not gonna go through all that again but there is a difference between being saved for your works which none of us are and being judged for your works okay we're all saved by grace every last one of us. If it wasn't for the grace of God, none of us would get to heaven, no matter how righteous you are, or how righteous you think you are. So none of us are saved by our works, but we are judged according to our works. This is the only church that's not judged according to their works. They are they are judged. They're given. They are uh, there. There is a judgment for their works in in terms of how um, you can lose your crown. It definitely says you can use, use your crown, lose your crown in this, this passage, the Church of Philadelphia. But this is the church, this, this church is different from all the others. You're not judged in the same manner as the other churches. And the reason is because they've been baptized into Christ Jesus. And I, like I said, I've proven to you on many occasions why this is a baptized believe. These ch this church are the baptized believers. They are also been adopted and that's why they're called phileo. They've been adopted. They're now brethren of Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ because we've been adopted through baptism. We, because we put on his DNA when we get into the waters of baptism. Okay. So anyway, <coughs> but this church has a problem. And that even though man can't shut the door on it, on them and their salvation, so it says Revelation 3 8, I know thy works before I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. So that's interesting right there. No man can shut it. No man can steal your salvation once you're in this church. Thou has a little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will come and make them worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. That's interesting. Let me just look at this word love here. To know that I have loved thee. Uh, he agapes them. Okay? Even though, like in Peter's case, Peter could only offer phileo love to the Lord. The Lord agapes them back. And this is what it says. Um, Revelation chapter 3. Of the church is the synagogue of Satan, we will defeat the synagogue of Satan. We have defeated already defeated the synagogue of Satan. We've already spiritually defeated the synagogue of Satan because no man can steal your salvation. The synagogue of Satan is controlled by the six six six. The they're controlled by the spirit of fallen man. Okay. They are they've infiltrated this spirit of fallen man has infiltrated the church on every level. Showing my little chart here has infiltrated the, the church on every level in order to subvert, to corrupt, to deceive, to um, steal, kill, and destroy, to to take away um, the saved of God uh, in Christ Jesus, and to steal them from salvation. But in this church. They're, they're not able to do that. No man can steal the salvation of this church, this church. However, they can steal your crown. Okay, just that's an interesting thing here. Um, however, in Christ Jesus, we've already defeated the synagogue of Satan because their inability, they have no right to, they haven't got the legal right to steal, steal your adoption in Christ Jesus. Even though this church only has has the imperfect love of Christ, the phileo, it is still a strong, it's still strong enough to defeat the synagogue of Satan. Okay, 
Christ, on the other hand, agapes this church. He agapes this church enough to be, and he promises this church that he will remove this church from the hour of tribulation that's going to come upon the whole world. Just a moment, I have to take care of the dog. Hold on just a second. Uh, I'm going to get back to what I was thinking. My train of thought. Um, okay. So the Lord agapes this church. And this is going to become as a surprise to the synagogue of Satan. They are, um, they say they're Jews, but at this moment, at this moment they're not. In fact, I believe that they are Jewish, most of the synagogue of Satan, not all of them. It has to do with, like I said, the synagogue of Satan are atheists and agnostics and people who are who are lukewarm towards God and they're they're disrespectful to God. They have no fear of God. Um, but the synagogue of Satan are also the ultra religious, the ultra religious. And I believe that that a lot of people who who are Jewish, whether from descent or whatever it is, it's not a matter of descent or genealogy. Just like Jesus, when Jesus confronted the Pharisees, it, he wasn't he wasn't questioning who their father was, or that, that they were children of Abraham. He was not questioning their genealogy. That was not the issue for him. The issue for him was their attitude, their repentance, their actual genuine love for God. People who have these these people who are of Jewish descent, who don't really regard they they say they love God, but the reality is they don't, and they've already written their own laws, they've written their own books that they follow. They they follow the the leader, they follow their own man men, uh, rabbis and teachers, and rather than follow God or follow Jesus or follow the prophets of God, they don't even read the Book of Isaiah, which they should. You know what I'm saying? They don't regard these other sacred texts rather than they've written their own and those are the ones they have fallen. Therefore, they are following fallen man is who they are. And Jesus no longer sees, even though they have the genealogy that would say that they are Jewish, but that's not the issue. The issue is that they have, they have fallen away from the faith. It's not about their genealogy because Jesus can make anybody a Jew like as he said, I can make these, you know, these rocks here, children of Abraham, if I wanted to. It's it's a matter of your heart. And it's about children of faith. We become children of Abraham through our attitudes, through our faith. This is what the faith in Hebrews is talking about the faith chapter when it talks about all these people who were guarded, who were counted as worthy because of their faith, even though they were sinners. They were sinners, but they had a heart for God and they had a change of attitude. Whereas this group of people, they say they're Jews, but God, when he looks at them, he doesn't see them as Jewish because they left the faith. They have fallen away from the truth. And though they may have the correct genealogy, the reality is their heart is far from God. So anyway, uh, Revelation chapter 3, 9 says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have agape. His perfect love is protecting this church. And the synagogue of Satan will come and worship at the feet of the church of Philadelphia. When and how do they do this? Well, I've already said before, when you look at the scriptures and it talks about the temple and how we who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit are the temple of God. And you see that we are the temple. We are made pillars in the temple. It continues to go on here. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall not, which shall come upon all the world to try them which dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh while I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I'll write upon the name of him um, the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear, that's, hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So, we since we're, we're the temple, we are the third temple. And Jesus says, anyone who destroys this temple, which we are, he will destroy. 
Jesus, when we are taken in the rapture in Revelation chapter 6, and we see in Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 7, you see the raptured church in heaven. We are serving in what? The temple in the spirit realm. We've been raptured to that place in the spirit realm. We've been taken to serve in the third temple. Then the physical manifestation has to come up and be manifested here on earth. The third temple is going to be built. It has to be built. There is no choice. It has to and must be built because this, this, the third, whatever's going on in the spirit realm must manifest in the physical. We who are the third temple of Christ because we've been indwelt with the Holy Spirit and we're raptured and we're taken into the spirit realm, into the third temple in the spirit realm, it must manifest in the physical. Okay? When that happens and all the, all the tribes and peoples of the earth come to the third temple in lukewarmness because they, they won't understand it, they don't understand the whole process, what's going on, the two witnesses will be out front making sure that nothing um, goes into that temple and defiles it for three and a half years and giving witness. The 144,000 who've been marked with the, the name of the Father are also there, making sure that nothing defiles that temple. But the Gentiles will be allowed in to that temple because, guess what? In the heavenly places, in the spirit realm, we who are representing that temple, we who are praying in that temple in the spirit realm, represents every tribe, kindred, tongue, and and people groups. We are all in that, we are, we are part of that third temple. But what will happen is, after the three and a half years, and the Antichrist spirit, the synagogue of Satan, takes over and defiles the temple, they will no longer allow the, the Gentiles to be participants. Okay? Unless, of course, you have the mark of the beast. And that is defilement. And that will give Christ permission, give him permission to, dis to, dis to um, destroy the Antichrist with plagues and all kinds of matter of pestilence and evil things. Give him permission to destroy them for, for attempting to de defile, for defiling the third temple. Okay? He hasn't got the right to be there. <coughs> but, they rep but they're represented by this 666, the spirit of 666. And that brings me to the church of Laodicea. This is who they are. The synagogue of Satan uh, will build the temple, interestingly enough. And they will come and worship at the feet of the Church of Philadelphia. Okay? That's what this means. Now, what's interesting, I, like I said, I've been thinking about this Church of Philadelphia, which I believe are re mostly represented by the ultra-religious. Um, and the reason why I also say that is because in Revelation chapter 7, you see this group of people who are Jewish men, 144,000, who are still on earth. But before the four angels that are sent to send this great calamity upon the earth, before the, the building of the third temple, an angel stops these um, four angels from sending or starting the this destruction after the rapture of the church from hurting earth until 144,000 Jewish men are sealed with the seal of God. And they're, they, um, they represent the whole of Israel except for the tribe of Dan. So 12,000 from each, and you can read it for yourself, Revelation chapter 7, 1 through 8. 12,000 are sealed from each one of these tribes. They're not converted people. These are not raptured people because they haven't yet been converted. And they, they don't have the seal of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit like the Church of Philadelphia. They only have the seal of the Father. Because how do I know this? Because the same group is mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. It's interesting that how this his, um, the Lord has um, numbered these chapters. Chapter 7. Church of Philadelphia is chapter 6. And 
um, that also mentions, of course, the Church of the, the Grace Church, which is number five, and also the, the last day church, the Laodicean Church, is number seven. In Revelation chapter seven, we also see the raptured church, the Church of Philadelphia, and we see the, this Church of uh, Laodicea being numbered, at least the, the, these uh, prime, uh, I think these are going to be the leaders of this last day's church, 144,000, which is not a lot, people, when you think about how many people are, have lived throughout the last 2,000 years and how many people have come into the church mm -hmm. on different levels. 144,000 isn't a whole lot. But they have a special, they have a special calling. And, and it's this, like I said, it goes back to this contrast between in Luke 7, again, on number, 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 number 7, between this woman who's weeping at the feet of Christ and this man who represents the synagogue of Satan. It, it, like I said, that verse, I mean, it's just that passage just came, keeps coming back to me as extremely prophetic. And here we have the same thing happening here. The 144,000 represents those religious spirits they weren't raptured people the reason they're not raptured because they're not in Christ they're not yet believers they don't become believers in Christ Jesus until the two witnesses are killed and they are taken up to heaven that's when they start to wake up to themselves truly wake up to themselves but what's interesting is that I, I, it's so hard for me to put this all out here because there's so much and I'm trying to I'm just going to keep trying <clears throat> forgive me if I'm not doing this as well as I'd like to in Revelation chapter 10 we see the angel giving the scroll to John and he's told he has to go witness again before many people chapter 11 we see the two witnesses on chapter 10 he's given the blueprints also he's given the blueprints for the temple in Revelation chapter 10 he's given a scroll to eat and he's told he has to go witness one more time before many people chapter 11 we see the two witnesses and they are given power they stand in front of the temple the newly built temple they are witnessing about Christ and they are despised. They are despised by Israel. They're despised by the lukewarm who come to visit the temple. They are despised by, um, like I said, the synagogue of Satan, the Laodicean church. They don't even know they're the Laodicean church. They don't even know that they've been called to, to be part of this new, this church. That's being the spirit of the church, which is the spirit of Laodicea. They don't know they're called. They, they're, they're drawn to the temple and they don't know why and they're worshiping there, but they, they can't figure it out why they're even there. They still don't get it. The 144,000 are worshiping in this temple, but they don't still, they haven't got their eyes fully open yet. They only know in part. They're still blinded to Christ. They're still blinded to why Christ loves the Church of Philadelphia and why he removed them. It's a mystery to them. It's a mystery that Christ would forgive this group of people enough to remove them from the hour of tribulation that had just fallen on them all. That this mountain and the comet or whatever it is that hits the earth and causes all this destruction. And yet this group of people removed, it doesn't it doesn't sink into to them as to why this is the why Christ would love them over them, uh, would love us over them. It doesn't make any sense to them. But they're compelled to build a temple, and these two witnesses, which one I believe is John, are now protecting the temple from, de from being defiled. The two witnesses are then killed, and everyone's rejoicing. Everyone's having a party. They're giving gifts to each other. They're so excited that these two guys who've tormented them for the past three and a half years, they would not allow them to take control of the temple the way they wanted to. And now they're dead. Yay, hoo-hoo, 
Hooray. Then after three and a half day days, these two witnesses stand up and suddenly their eyes are open. Suddenly they see the truth and how they have been deceived and they've deceived themselves and who really what the spirit of Antichrist has done and how they have been following man rather than following God and their eyes are opened. <clears throat> And then the temple in heaven is opened in heaven. It talks about how the temple is then opened in heaven. <clears throat> Revelation 11, 19. Then we see this interesting scenario. This woman, a woman, here is the woman. Who is this woman? This is the forgiven woman who's represented in Revelation and John, and excuse me, in Luke 7. This, full, this, this fallen woman who is who's at the feet of Jesus, wiping her hair with this, with, on the feet of Jesus and, and crying and weeping and, and um, using ointment to anoint his feet, which represents the good news that has set her free, set her free by his forgiveness. He sets her free by forgiving her much and she loves him much. She, uh, she not just phileos him, she agapes him. This woman represents the perfect that comes, the perfect agape. She offers him agape because she doesn't love him in part. She loves him the whole way. Her heart is all his. She is not holding back her love for him. As he had, didn't hold back his love for her, she doesn't hold back her love for him. She has come to that perfect place of love. So this rep this woman represents the bride. She is the bride. She has been shown to be without spot or wrinkle. Why? Because she's in Christ Jesus. And she's been set free. And she loves with agape. Whereas the synagogue of Satan and even the church of Philadelphia couldn't come to that place. Couldn't transcend to that agape, the perfect. This woman here does. She transcends to the perfect. And she is without spot or wrinkle. And it's proven that she is because she gives birth to a child. This woman gives birth. And she has on her head a crown of 12, 12, stars, 12 stars, which represents government. She's been crowned with government. Also represents, of course, the government of Israel. <laughs> she represents Israel, but she not just represents Israel. She represents the Gentile nations too because she's a Gentile bride. But she's crowned with government. And that's what the Twelve represents. <clears throat> and she gives birth. As a result of giving birth to this perfect, she's a perfect woman, not because of her her own perfect but because of the, she's under perfect grace she knows she's a fallen woman she was a fallen woman but her perfect love for Christ Jesus sets her free from her imperfections her the forgiveness that the Lord gives to her sets her free and makes her without spot or wrinkle as a result she gives birth to a child this child rules with a rod of iron not with grace, but with a rule, rules with a rod of iron, <clears throat> and is caught up to, to heaven. This woman is extremely important. She is, uh, she's absolutely important in understanding if she does not exist, if we ignore her, if we remove her from this whole scenario, there is no millennial reign. As I've said before, she is vital to this whole scenario, if she does not overcome and transcend to the agape, there is, and, and proves that she is without spot or wrinkle, there is no millennial reign because Christ has to rule on every level that man struggles in, in relationships, with money, with faith, with um, marital relationships, with childbirth. I mean, the whole shebang, people. He rules on every level. I know it's not popular among Christian theologists. It's, oh, no, they, you, you, no, no, that's no way. No, 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 this woman's Israel and Israel alone. No, no, she's not Gentile. She's Israel. 
in effect, she is kind of an Israel. She's spiritual Israel. She is the new Jerusalem. It's who she is. She is the bride of Christ. She does not exist and she does not give birth. There is no millennial reign. Because whatever happens in the spirit realm manifests in the physical. If she does not give birth, there can be no people group that are saved because she is saved. After she gives birth, she's protected and taken to a safe place. Her and her child are protected. And that she represents those Christians who are left on earth, those who have clung to Jesus Christ and are protected supernaturally during the last three and a half years of the, the terrible things that are getting ready to go on and come upon the earth. If she is not protected in the spirit, there is no protection for those people who are left on earth. And if they're not protected, if this, the people, the followers of Christ on, on earth are not protected, and saved supernaturally. There is no millennial reign because there'll be no one left to repopulate the earth. She represents repopulation. She represents giving birth. She represents, you know, the world can't continue if there is no one left, if there's no women on earth or no men on earth to repopulate. Sexuality and repopulation are part of God's plan. And always have been from the beginning, people. Genesis, the book of Genesis, the first chapter. He blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply. That was always part of God's plan. He created us, us all the whole creation, to be in his image. And we should be able to see that from everything we see. And what we have somehow exonated sexuality from the whole idea of God. No, no, God. God is not sexual. Ooh. Blasphemy, and yet, how can that be blasphemy when it's everything in creation is, is sexual and reproductive? It doesn't make sense. And I don't care whether you like it or not, I'm going to say it because it needs to be said. This woman is the bride of Christ, and she gives birth. And if she doesn't give birth, there is no millennial reign, period. Get over it. Wake up. Grow up. This woman has transcended to the agape, and thank God she does. Thank God she does. As a result of her transcension to the agape above the brotherhood, the brotherhood, you see, you see, Peter couldn't understand the agape because he's a man. He didn't get it. And you look at Luke, this woman understands the agape. Women understand the agape. And they need the agape. Okay, now I, I know this is really hard for me. I'm, I'm still struggling with it. I'm trying to get my mind around all this. But it's 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 coming to me. I'm seeing it more clearer. I'm seeing it more clearly. I'm seeing it more clearly. But as a result of this woman giving birth, Michael is able to stand up. And he does. there's a war in heaven. He's able to throw down the dragon, which is, he throws down this dragon, which represents, of course, the Leviathan. The spirit of Leviathan, the spirit of the 666 spirit, the spirit of 666. It's a spirit of the children of pride, which we see in the book of Job. That book is prophetic, people. This man is plagued with all kinds of diseases. He's sitting on the ground, scraping his sores. And he doesn't not see, he can't see his own pride. He can't see, even though he's this perfect man, he can't see how his pride has put him in the position that he's in. He doesn't see why he needs to repent. The same with the synagogue of Satan. They're under the spirit of Leviathan. They're under the spirit of the dragon. But when the two witnesses come, their eyes are open. Oh, when they're raised up, they ascend to heaven. They suddenly perceive the woman. They perceive that he loved her with the agape and she loves him with the same kind of perfect love that casts out fear. They they are now, they're being set free from their own blindness. I hope you understand what I'm saying. This is really deep stuff. They, they perceive that they are been under a spirit of Leviathan. They've been under the spirit of 666, which is why they become the, the Laodicean church. That's when they are, that's just when they're, 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 they're confronted, but they're also this is when they get their, their wake up moment. And many, 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 many people, not just 144,000, but millions of people 
will wake up and they will not receive that mark and praise God because of the bride of Christ because she's been purified and she has proven it and that spirit of Leviathan is thrown down that they will have grace given to them to be able to withstand the mark of the beast and face their own death that's why the church of Laodicea and the bride are connected the I, like I said, the irony of Luke 7 is so incredible. She's she's forgiven much, but so is the church of, La uh, the church of Laodicea, the, the, uh, the, the, the church of synagogue of Satan that is converted to the church of Laodicea. They, they, they transcend from the church of La Satan, what it's, what it's going to take, what it takes to get them to convert is tremendous. But this woman gives birth. As a result, Satan is thrown down. They're woken up. They finally see the truth. And as a result of this bride, the bride, that's why she's number seven. The church and the bride are connected. She is not the church of, of the Philadelphians. She is not. The bride is the church of Laodicea. And it's not because she's lukewarm. It's because she participates in the salvation and the wake-up call of the church of Laodicea. Isn't this amazing? That's why she's number seven. That's why she's the crowning glory. That woman in Revelation, uh, Luke chapter seven, she represented something that the Lord was getting. She was prophetic. That was a prophetic passage. Luke seven is hugely prophetic. And I, and like I said, I'm exploring my mind. I keep thinking about it. It's hugely prophetic. She is represented, the bride of Christ is represented by this woman. She is a woman, okay? <clears throat> the 144,000 are not the bride. They represent government, however. They are, they, because the, this church, the Church of Laodicea are given blessings, and they're told they're given, they're going to be given thrones. And I'm going to show it to you right here. Let's just read the church of Laodicea, shall we? Uh, Revelation chapter 3, 14. And unto the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Isn't that interesting? He takes them back to the beginning. He takes them back to the beginning. That's what I'm saying to you. This is He's going right back. When it should have been perfect in the garden, he's taking them back to perfection. I know thy works, thou art neither, neither cold nor hot, cold, and I, I would that were, thou wert cold or hot, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. They are rejected from what? They're rejected from the rapture. He has rejected them, and he's also, like, like I said, the synagogue of Satan. They are not Jews in God's eyes, even though their genealogy may say, oh yeah, I've got Jewish ancestry, and yes, I'm a Jew, and I'm a Pharisee, and blah, 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 blah. It's like what Paul was saying, you know, I, yeah, I'm a, I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. I had all the right lineage. I knew all this and that and the other thing. But God has rejected them from being, he no longer considers them Jews because they no longer consider him as their God. They put on a show during the festivals and the holidays, but the reality, man was their God. They, they themselves, they were, they were their own God. So God has rejected them from being Jews. It's right there, okay? Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and need of nothing, and knows not that thou art thou wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They're blind, people, and they're naked. They're not even wearing dirty clothes. They're wearing no clothes as far as, as, far as God is concerned. You know what God says about nudity? He doesn't want to look at it. It's not, his, not it's none of his business. He didn't, he's not concerned about your nudity, people. Even when a husband and wife are naked, that's for them. He's not concerned. He's not interested in looking at your nudity. He created man and woman naked in the garden for their own enjoyment, but not for his. He's not. He, when he saw them, he saw light. They were clothed in light, but when they saw each other, they saw each other as they were. Until sin came came along and they tried to cover themselves up with, with fig leaves. And he was really upset about it. God was upset that they, this had happened to them. Who told you you were naked? 
<laughs> you know, he was like, so here it is that they were naked and, and, and he's, he doesn't want to look at their nakedness. That's the last thing he wants to look at. I counsel thee to buy me uh, gold tried in the fire. See, these people are all about gold. They're all about money, about riches and about looking good. You know, I got the right clothes. I got the right car. I got the right this and the right that. I buy thee to got, buy from me gold tried in the fire that thou may be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed that the, same, the shame that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with the eyes self that thou may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten and, zealous, and be zealous therefore and repent. It's interesting. He says here, I love you. He does love them. Let's just see what kind of love he loves them with. Let's see. Uh, Church of Laodicea. As many as I love, as many as I phileo. Isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? As many as I phileo. God loves all of us with an agape love, and yet this church, he phileos them. That needs some thought, doesn't it? This needs some thought. He does not agape this church. He phileos this church. Isn't that interesting? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten and be zealous therefore and repent. He agapes the church of Philadelphia that phileos him. And yet he phileos this church that ends up agapeing him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Isn't this interesting? Because there's this, I believe there's a prophecy that talks about the Jewish people expecting Elijah to come and knock on their door and sup with them and have dinners. That's why they have on, on certain meals and certain holidays. They always have a plate for Elijah. Isn't that interesting that he would say that I will knock on your door and sup with you? Maybe this is what he's talking about. Elijah is going to come and personally visit all these people or he himself will personally visit these people. Maybe he's the Elijah that's been prophesied that will come and knock on the door that these people have been waiting for. And this is when they will start to wake up. When he personally comes during the, the, the uh, uh, time of the building of the third temple, he will personally come and knock on their door. We're going to have a conversation just like he did with the Pharisee and had that dinner with Simon in Luke 7. And he will start to, they will start to perceive Christ's love for that woman, that fallen woman that the, that they believe she didn't deserve her, his forgiveness. And they believed that Jesus was a false prophet for allowing her to touch him. They will start to perceive Christ's love for the bride and that he loved her with an agape love and she loves him back the same way. Maybe that's what they'll talk about. Isn't this interesting? To him that overcometh, I will, I, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, and even as I overcame, and even, and am sat down with my father in his throne. Uh, he that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith from the churches. So this church, when they overcome, will be granted thrones. What kind of thrones are they being granted? They're given the thrones of judgment. How do I know and why am I saying that? They will be given the thrones of judgment. The 144,000, like, let's go back to the 144,000. I know I'm jumping around a lot and there's a lot of stuff here, but this is what's been going through my mind. All this stuff has been going through my mind and I'm trying to put it all together. Revelation chapter 14, we see the 144,000. They're standing on in heaven. This is after they've been martyred. And I've, I've come to that conclusion after realizing, I said, well, I didn't know, know whether they were raptured or martyred. I've come to the conclusion that they are, they are martyred because they are the first fruits of the church of Laodicea. The Laodicean church are martyred Jewish or not just Jewish, but also Gentile people who refuse to take the mark of the beast. They are the first fruits. They were the ones that were sealed, the 144,000 that were sealed in, the, in Revelation chapter 7 before this great calamity comes upon the earth. And this 144,000 we see now in heaven. When do we see them? 
after the mark of the beast has been established. Revelation chapter 13, the mark of the beast has been established. And then we see the 144,000 in heaven. They are the first fruits of the martyred saints of the wine harvest. And we know this is the wine harvest. I know, and I'm not going to go through it right now because you can look for yourself. This is these, these are the first fruits of the wine harvest. If they are the wine harvest, that means that they've been killed and they've had their heads cut off. Okay. And you see them <coughs> in the heaven. And they have the name of the Father written on their heads. They don't have the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They don't have the fullness of God. They don't have the fullness of God. They don't have the name. They don't have the fullness like the Church of Philadelphia has the fullness, which we know has the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They only have the name of the Father written on their foreheads. And maybe that's why Christ says, I phileo you. There is a masculine energy here. They are... This is the church of an mass of a masculine energy. They are not the church. They're not the, the spirit of the bride. They are the spirit of the bridegroom. They only have the spirit of the father, not even the spirit, spirit of the son on them. They only have the spirit of the father. They're pure masculine energy. Um, and I looked and uh, I looked and lo, a lampstone on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. It's right there. And I heard a voice from heaven and a loud voice of many waters and the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and for the, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man can learn this song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So they are given a special song because they are the first fruits of the, the church of Laodicea. But they are also Jewish men. So, okay? so they're given a special position. These were they which were not defiled with women, for they were virgins. These which follow the Lamb wherever he goes, these were redeemed among the men, uh, among men being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. So they're the first fruits of the church of Laodicea, the synagogue of Satan, who had been converted. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were found, they are without fault before the throne of God. Okay, so now, as a result, they are the first fruits, they're the first ones who have been martyred. Then this angel goes throughout all of all the world, or Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, unto every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of judgment is come. So it's about judgment. The 144,000 are redeemed first. And now the hour of what? Judgment. This is the Laodicean church is about the hour of judgment. Judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Then comes the wine and it goes on. It talks about, um, um, so this angel, these angels are going about, uh, spreading more. And like, the mercy of God is amazing. God is so merciful that he's going to have this, these angels manifest in heaven. You're going to see them. There's going to be no veil. The veils will be lifted once the, the two witnesses and the 144,000 are taken. The veil, all, all the veils are gone. And they are preaching, one last preaching, before to, to convince the people of the earth to not take the mark of the beast. To have, be strong during this terrible, terrible time of decision. And many, like I said, millions and millions of people will not take the mark of the beast because of all these events. Um... So it says Babylon has fallen. So he's, that's one of the things he's talking to them about. No, don't take it. Um, the same shall, 1410, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in the mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. Um, Uh, Revelation 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Bright, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Lord, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow with follow them. So now, see, after the angels have spread the gospel in this incredible manifestation of God's mercy, one last push to convert people before the mark of the beast is completely implemented, whether you have to take it or not. He, they're doing one last gospel push. God is so good and so merciful. 
In Revelation chapter 14, 14, you see Christ on the cloud waiting to harvest the earth on the wine, the wine harvest. And I looked and behold, a white cloud upon the cloud sat one like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice that sat on the cloud, sat on the cloud, thrust in thy circle and reap for the time for the time to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he sat on the cloud, thrust in the sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. Um, and an angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he having a heart sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had the power, power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vines of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his circle, sickle on the earth, and gathered the vines of the earth, and cast into the great wine prep press of God's wrath and the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press even as the horse is bridled by the space of the, a thousand six hundred um, six hundred furlongs that's just an indication of how many people will die as a result of not wanting to take the mark of the beast they will not take the mark of the beast and millions and millions of people would rather die after seeing all what they witness once that has happened you see this, uh, the, the people who've had uh, victory over the mark of the beast, Revelation chapter 15. <coughs> I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them was filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that have gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the num number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song, song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord God, and glorify thy name? For thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy, so not just Israel people, all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. So what his judgments? It's not his mercy, it's not his grace, it's not his forgiveness, his judgments this is judgment is not given to the church of philadelphia the church of philadelphia is about love <laughs> we're about love we're about serving in the temple we're about praying for the nations of the people of the earth we are about love we're not about judgment judgment is given to the church of laodicea that is their job not our job it's their job he's going to give it to them judgment will be given to them there's more here. I'm just keep going. And uh, when you read about the Song of Moses, which you find at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and you read the book of, of, of um, Song of Moses, it's actually a song of judgment on, on, the, on the world for their unfaithfulness to God. It's interesting. It's a song of judgment. Okay? Song of Moses sounds pretty. <laughs> you know, oh, we're escaping and it's all great and wonderful and let's praise God. You no, know, it's a song of judgment. It's a song of judgment. That's the Song of Moses. It's in the end of the book of Deuteronomy. So these people are all harvested. And now the end of the uh, harvest has happened. The last person who's going to be saved is saved. God is so good and so merciful. He will hold back his judgment and his wrath and judgment on the world until the last soul is saved. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? What an amazing, merciful God we serve. Then you see this happening and then all hell breaks loose and God sends out his seven bowls of wrath. And it's it's not pretty people. Those people who have taken the mark of the beast, they are systematically destroyed from plagues and war and pestilence and all kinds of horrible things that happen. But it comes upon those who've taken the mark. Okay. You see their defeat in Revelation chapter 19. And then Revelation chapter 20, we see the first resurrection. And let's just read about the first resurrection. That's Re Re uh, Revelation chapter 20. Not, not, is it 19? Or, no, it's 20. I think it's 20. This is the thousand year reign. This is the millennial reign. Like I said, people, if there is no one left to repopulate the earth, this can't happen. <coughs> but as a result, there was a first resurrection. 
Uh, we Satan is thrown into the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 24. We see, this, this, this is what it says. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. To whom? Who was judgment given to? Let's just see. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither was, had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the li dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay? There's so a lot of people getting this mixed up. I did too. When I was growing up, we all believed, I believed, and we were told that there was only one resurrection, and then comes judgment, and that was it. One resurrection. We're all resurrected at the same time. We all go to heaven and there's, that's the judgment. Nothing about a thousand year reign. We knew nothing about this. But according to the scriptures, there is a thousand year reign and there's a first resurrection of the dead. And that is the church of Laodicea and the, also the martyred saints from the church of Smyrna. They are participants in the first resurrection. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, going back to, I want to go back to Revelation chapter 12, this woman who gives birth in heaven, and she, she gives birth, I want you to read what it says about this, the people who are saved on earth as a result of her giving birth in heaven. Um, It says that when the dragon is thrown to the earth, this is Revelation chapter 12, 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. He's persecuting the church. Okay? He says he, he goes to make war, war with the church. The woman, who is the woman? Who is the bride in Christ? She's the church. <laughs> She's the church. She is the Gentile bride in heaven. He's making war with who? He's not making war with the Israel. He's making war with the church. And the woman who was given two wings of the great eagle, eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she brought, where she is nourished for time, times and half a time for, from the face of the serpent. Serpent. So here, I want you to see this. This is important to understand this because we have always assumed that this is just referring to Israel. Oh, Israel is the one that flees into the wilderness because she is the woman. No, <laughs> wrong. That can't be. Because she's, um, because the, I say, well, Israel, you know, it was Mary who gave birth to, birth to Jesus. This is not talking about that, people. That was in the past. This is a new situation. What, just to explain something here. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So is Satan, by the way. What happened in the past keeps repeating itself over and over again until there's resolution. Okay? That's what happens. There's. Satan it is still has the same old creepy character. He does the same old things he always does. He hasn't changed the strategy because he can't. He can't change because he's the same guy. He's got a stuck, he's stuck at his personality. His attitudes are still the same. Well, guess what? God doesn't change either. What happened in the past will happen in the future. Okay? What happened in the past? Uh, the Holy Spirit gave birth to Jesus Christ in the heavenly realms. Satan made war. He was cast out. When do, why, do we, why do I say that? It was because Abraham and Sarah represent something that happened in the past. They were repeating something that happened, already happened. There was nothing new under the sun. Everything keeps repeating itself until there's resolution. Sarah gave birth <laughs> in her old age to a son who became the heir. He was the anointed one. What happened? Hagar... And her son got disinherited. Of course there's a conflict. Same thing happened. You can read about that in Galatians 4. It's right there. Sarah was an allegory for something that already happened in the spirit realm. And it keeps repeating itself. The same pattern repeats. Mary gives birth. Yes, I agree. She represents, she's part, part, a part of the scenario. But she's not the end part of the scenario. This is talking about Revelation. This is talking about the future. This is talking about the future. This is not talking about the past and something that happened. This is talking about the bride and the bridegroom. The church has already been raptured. This is a future event. So this can't be Mary. 
It can't be. And on top of which, it when you talk, when you read further about what this woman says, this woman who gives birth is as a result of her giving birth, throws down the dragon. The dragon hasn't yet been thrown down, people. The dragon's still in the heavenly realm. So you know, if you're not aware of that, I don't know where you live. This world is full of sin. The dragon is still in control of this world. Uh, what are you talking about? What? What? Yes, people. Are, I mean, wake up. The dragon, Satan, is still in control of this world until this event happens. And then when this happens, he is thrown down. And he no longer has control. And Jesus now has control of the atmosphere. As we see later on in the chapter, he's sitting on the clouds. He's got angels flying around. He's got control of the air. Satan no longer can hinder him because he's got control. Like I said, this woman is absolutely vital in the scenario of the redemption of the synagogue of Satan. Interesting. <laughs> so this woman, he goes after this remnant and this woman is protected in the heavenly realms, in the spirit realm, she's protected. And as a result, whatever it's going on in the spirit realm manifests in the physical. And this woman who's on earth, who's the remnant of what? The church who've been left behind, who are still saved, but who have the spirit of Christ in them and on them. They are the remnant of Christ. They're the remnant of the bride. They're the remnant of the church who've been left behind to repopulate the earth. And they're supernaturally protected in order to be able to do that. Because if they're not protected, there is no millennial reign. <clears throat> and the, the serpent cast out of his mouth water, as it were, a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to, cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth so he can't destroy her he's not able he doesn't have the right or the authority to touch her because she's been saved in the spirit realm because this woman has been found without spot or wrinkle and has given birth through agape love the same love that christ has given to her she has given back to him she's transcended the brotherhood this is the bride. She has transcended the brotherhood to the agape. As a result, she is the perfect. As a result, she is the perfect and she has given birth. And he has now lost legal right to touch the brethren, the, the people who've been left behind, the remnant of her seed, this is what it says here, on the earth to harm them. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Uh, where do we see this? This her seed. He will put him into between you, her, your seed and her seed. This is a future event. That's a future event when he says he will, the, the, that her seed will crush his head. The seed that she, what, what seed is he talking about? The seed that she just gave birth to. The bride gives birth. The bride, the agape love God, that the bride and the bridegroom have for each other give birth to a child they give birth the agape the perfect and the, the, the dragon makes war with her that the remnant of her the church that's left behind and the remnant of her seed which keeps keeps the commandment of god and have what the testimony of jesus christ that should say everything right there people this is not the wine harvest this is the oil harvest. This are the people, this is why it says, do not harm the oil and the wine. The wine are going to be martyred later on, so they, they're not, the Satan is not allowed to destroy them in the Revelation chapter um, chapter 8, when the, this, this terrible destruction comes down. The oil and the wine are supernaturally protected because the wine are saved for salvation. You know, they're, they're going to be harvested later with the head, cutting off their heads when they have to make the decision between the mark of the beast and and uh and martyrdom and also the oil is also saved the remnant that is saved are supernaturally protected in order to what repopulate the earth and they are they, and they are supernaturally protected but only because the woman the bride has given birth and because she has been taken to safety 
As a result, the remnant of her seed who is still left on earth, who are what? Who keep the commands of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It shows you right here that all, not all Christians will be taken to heaven during the rapture. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting, people? Not all Christians, and they obviously are Christians, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is not the, the Laodicean church. This is not the Laodicean church. Although they are left behind, they are not the Laodicean church. They are the oil harvest. They are the oil, and they're left behind in order to repopulate. But they are supernaturally protected. I hope this is making sense to you. It makes sense to me. It's starting to come very, very clear to me. Also, another thing, <clears throat> I think I'm going to try and uh, uh, close this video. There's so much here, and I have so many verses I could show you. But I, I'm, I've already talked about all this stuff before in the past. And it's so hard to go back to something you've already talked about a thousand times before and reiterate it because, but you, and you're still trying to bring up something new. This is, this is huge stuff, people. This is huge. The bride, this Gentile bride who's been forgiven much, who has transcended the phileo to the agape, which is the perfect. She's transcended to the perfect. Okay? She's transcended to the perfect. I want to give you men out there, <laughs> uh, um, I want you to understand something. The Lord's and I, uh, I talked about this just a time briefly in the, in the beginning of my video here. The Lord gave me a revelation and I, when he had called me to all this and I, when I started my videos, I talked, talked, talked about how the Lord had called me to this prophetic ministry and, <clears throat> and I've been struggling with a lot of stuff and wondering why this and why that, and this doesn't make sense. And, I'm trying to sort this stuff out in my head, trying to sort it out, trying to sort it out, trying to sort it out. Where is it saying in the scripture? Where is, where is this represented? What does this mean? What is that? Anyway, one of the things he said to me, which, uh, oh, it's so hard to say, say all this stuff. Um, when I first, when the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord came to me, um, I, I was going through, I was going through a sacrifice of worship. Um, I'd get up Saturdays morning and Sunday morning and give an hour of an hour of my time just to, just to sacrifice to the Lord with, with worship. And this was going on for about a year or maybe two years. Um, and I wasn't seeing any result. I didn't know whether the Lord was even hearing my prayers, but I just decided I was going to do it anyway. And then lo and behold, this miracle thing happened and the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Jesus Christ came to me and was manifesting in almost a physical manner. I couldn't see him. I couldn't touch him. Like I put up my hand and touch him. I couldn't do that, but I could feel him. And that's, it's hard for me to even explain just like I can't explain the brain surgery. I could feel him. I couldn't touch him, but I could feel him. I could feel his presence. I could feel his energy. I could feel that he was standing right in front of me. Um, I, I just can't explain it. I could hear him speaking to me, but not in an audible voice. It was just this, he would almost like put thoughts in my head. Like, just like, you know, you know, all of a sudden you're getting this, this thought and you think, where's that coming from? Anyway, when all this started happening, uh, I asked the Lord something, or I said something to the Lord, which I'm not going to tell you yet, so because it's still, I feel, I feel a little embarrassed to the, by what I said to him. But he responded in a way that was quite surprising to me when I said something to him, because I was actually thinking, I said something to him about King Solomon. Okay, let me, let me just qualify it that way. I said something to him about King Solomon and about all these women that King Solomon had in his in his entourage. And I said, well, you know, you're the king of kings and you must have <laughs> women, basically. I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly what I said, but I said, you know, you must have some women in your entourage. So I'd like to know a little bit more, more basically, you know, I, wanted, I was questioning about the situation about King Solomon and his relationship to this whole thing. And the Lord said something very interesting to me. He said, I must choose my bride from among 
the daughters of men. And I, it shocked me because that was certainly not my thought. I certainly wasn't thinking this, especially when I uh, said what I said to him. And he said it, I said, so I said, what? <laughs> I couldn't believe I just heard this. And he said it a second time. I must choose my bride from among the daughters of men. To which I said, what? <laughs> Again, I, I, I was like, oh, uh, what? I didn't get it. He said it a third time, just as patiently. I must choose my bride from among the daughters of men. To the third time I said, oh, who, me? To which he said, yes. To which I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Not knowing what that meant, or why he would have said that to me, or what it imp 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 uh, what the implications of it was, it didn't, I, I, it went right over my head. But because I had asked something of him or said something to him, and this is his response, I decided to go with it, saying, okay, <laughs> if that's your response to me, then okay. Now, I've been doing some thinking about this. And <clears throat> I've been doing some thinking about this because what he said to me was interesting. He didn't say, I must choose my bride from among mankind. He didn't say, uh, I must choose my bride from the men and women of Adam and Eve. Uh, he didn't say, I must choose my bride from among the church. Uh, or the church of Philadelphia. Uh, he said, I must choose my bride from among the daughters of men. Now, what's really hard for a lot of people, particularly men, <laughs> to perceive that women actually have a place in God's redemption theology. We've kind of put women off to the side. Yeah, they give birth. Yeah, they give children. Yeah. We, we all become sons. We're all sons of God and that's it. And women are kind of, are kind of, they, the, the ego, I don't know what it is. It must be male ego. I don't understand it personally because being a woman, I don't get it. But the male ego is such that it really has a hard time struggling with the feminine identity being part of the whole scenario, the whole God thing, scenario, salvation plan thing. And we've kind of put femininity off to the side, like I said, to, you know, it's, it's there, but uh, it's actually, you know, not that important. <coughs> <coughs> but this thing that the Lord said to me keeps coming back to me. And like I said before, Peter, who was his trusted premier apostle, even higher in rank than Paul, who was the, the, the apostle to the Gentiles, Peter outranked Paul. Peter outranks Paul. But Peter couldn't bring himself to agape the Lord. He couldn't bring himself to that perfection, the perfect love. Now, I know this is really going to be really hard for a lot of you guys out there. Maybe not so much for the women. Women, I think, will understand this more than the men. But it's my understanding and my belief that it's not your place to go and be the perfect. That you all never have the position of being the bride, that that position is given to women. Now, why am I saying that? Because first of all, because of what the Lord said to me, that just, like I said, opened my eyes, although I didn't understand it and didn't, couldn't perceive it until now it's starting to come to me clearer, that that position of agape unto the perfect is given to women. The bride is the woman. The bride is the feminine spirit. The bride is going to be represented by women and women alone. That might actually give you a lot of you guys a lot of relief. 
I can relax. Oh, good. I'm not the bride. <laughs> you know what? In, in fact, it probably make a lot of you, uh, like I said, take a big sigh of relief. You will not represent the bride. Women will represent the bride. Why do I say that? Like I said, first of all, this woman in Revelation chapter 12 who gives birth, she's a woman. It can't be a man. Men don't give birth. I don't know about you. I don't know where you come from. If you believe that that woman is a man, uh, um, what planet are you living on? Because it's not how it works here. Okay? Doesn't work that way here, people. Doesn't work that way in God's kingdom. The woman who gives birth in heaven is a woman. That's what it says. Uh, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman. A woman? What? A woman. Yeah, a woman. Oh, there it is. A woman in close to the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars and she being with child... Uh, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now show me a man who's given birth and maybe, 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 maybe I'll give it some consideration. But until you have actually proven to me that men can give birth, that is a woman. Okay. Let's start, start, let's start getting things right here, people. This is a woman. And it is in the Luke chapter seven. This, that's a woman who's at his feet crying tears. This woman, who is the bride, is actually represented by women. It is, it is our place to represent the bride, not men. You, like I said, I don't believe you have the right or going to be given the ability to transcend to the agape. It is not in you to be able to do that. It is given for women. It is there. It is there. We are given we are given a place in the entourage of Christ. Now I'm gonna show you something here. I'm gonna show you something. First of all, um uh how many times have you seen the passages about Zion? I didn't actually cue anything up, but Zion, the daughters of Zion, the daughters of Zion, the daughters of Zion, Zion, let me see, it has Zion. The Zion is a, another name for the Holy Spirit. Um <coughs> Zion is often cont uh, is accompanied with the phrase, the daughters of Zion. Was he just, you know, oh, that's just a nice phrase. To no, no, it's not a nice phrase. It's about something. It's about something. This women, this is talking about the Zion. Uh, this is a feminine spirit, the daughters of Zion. Uh, just for example, uh, Micah 4, 8. O thou, O tower of flock, a stronghold of the daughter of Zion. Unto thee shall it come, even in the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is another name, another name for the Holy Spirit. Uh, Micah 4.10, be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now thou shalt go forth out of the city and thou shalt dwell in the field and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou, be, shalt thou be delivered for the Lord shall redeem thee from the hands of thine enemy. Who is doing battle in Babel in uh, Revelation chapter uh Revelation, the book of Revelation, who's falling? Babylon. It is a future event. This is not just talking about when when Israel was stuck in 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 Babylon. That was a, that was a the future. Maybe that's the past, showing something that was going to happen in the future. The daughter of Zion was going to do battle with Babylon, and we've been doing battle with ba Babylon. Okay, we have been now, even now. I mean, read Revelation chapter nineteen. Who's falling? Babylon. Babylon is the one who's falling. But who's doing battle? With giving a birth like a child? Uh, um, Micah 10, be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Daughter of Zion. This is a woman. This is a feminine spirit. Like a woman in travail, be now the, uh, go forth and thou shalt dwell in the field and thou shalt go even to Babylon. Even though thou shalt be delivered for the Lord shall redeem thee from the hands of thine enemy. What's going on in Revelation chapter 12? She defeats Babylon by giving birth. Zephaniah uh, 3.14 Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice and of, with all thy heart, O daughter of, Z of Jerusalem. Uh, it just keeps going. So the Zion is the Holy Spirit. It's another name for the Holy Spirit. But it's talking to this daughter, this woman who gives birth. Spiritual Israel is going to give birth. The bride of Christ will give birth. 
She's crowned with 12 stars. And also she's related to the synagogue of Satan because the synagogue of Satan are unconverted Jews who have not yet come to conversion. The 144,000, they're directly related to the bride. And it, like I said, it, this, this Luke 7 passage is so prophetic and it's actually, it's a prophetic view of what's really going on here. This is amazing. Okay, so another another passage. I was talking to Jesus about Solomon. <clears throat> I said something to Jesus about Solomon and about all the women that he had in his entourage. And I'm just going to read something about this. This is what came to me about King Solomon. And I know you guys are freaking out about this, but that's okay. I don't care. Uh, King Solomon, when he built the temple, he married a... African queen, he had an African princess. He was actually an Egyptian princess. And then we also have him marrying another African queen, Queen Sheba, who comes up to, brings him spices. She, isn't this interesting? She comes up, she's heard about his wisdom. She brings him spices from her land and precious jewels. She's giving him an offering, but this wonderful anoint, ointment, she gives him this wonderful sweet smelling incense ointment and um, uh, healing balms. And she's, she's offering it to him. She it is also told that she actually married him, ends up giving him a child. She ends up with a child. She takes that child and takes it back to Africa. Is this an allegory? Is this just a coincidence? It's not just a coincidence this has happened to King Solomon, that this woman, this African queen, comes up, get, offers him all these wonderful smelling ointments and beautiful trees that are used for incense. They fall in love. They She gives him a child. She takes that child back to Africa. She flees to the wilderness, basically. Is this just a coincidence that it happened? No, it's not a coincidence. Okay. <clears throat> so something about Solomon. Let's read something about Solomon. Solomon had a problem. He, well, he loved women. Okay. It's not, is that a problem? I don't think it's a problem. But in Solomon's case, it became a problem because he loved women a lot. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. King Solomon, uh, First Kings 11, 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughters of daughter of Pharaoh, which was his first wife, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, and of the nations concerning which the Lord says unto the children, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon claimed unto, unto these when in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart. And it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. And his heart as was the heart of David his father. So for Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abominations of the Ammonites. So, so what happened is that Solomon ended up marrying all these women. Yeah, 700. Let's just read that again one more time. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. So he had a lot of women in his entourage, in his household. Where they all lived, I have no idea. Housing them could have been quite a problem. However, that's how many he had in his entourage. And I, as I was saying, I said something to the Lord about Solomon in what I said to the Lord, which I'm not going to tell you. And <coughs> um, so anyway, but they, they were of the Gentile nations and they had false gods, which is interesting. And why am I saying this is interesting? Because when I think about Jesus, he marries his Gentile bride. He loves his Gentile bride. It was it wrong for him. This is what they, in, in um, Luke 7 the Pharisee is angry with Jesus or saying, you know, if he knew what kind of woman he was touching him, he would, you know, how can he call himself a prophet? She was a sinner, just like these women are sinners. Solomon couldn't handle it. He didn't have the ability to handle the situation he found himself in. But Jesus can. And why is that? Because Jesus 
has conquered the spirit of Solomon in that he, instead of being converted to these false gods of the, his Gentile bride, he's converting his ch Gentile bride to the true God. He is sanctifying her. He's, he's taking her through the process of removing all these false idols, these false gods, these false theologies. He's taking her through the process of perfection so that she is loving him with the agape that he deserves to be loved. He is taking his bride through the process, through because she's the daughter of Zion, he is sanctifying her so that she is like his mother. I want a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. She is a pearl and the only girl that daddy ever had. <laughs> He's, he's taking, he, he is conquering the folly of Solomon and he's taken his Gentile bride and married her and he's taking her through the process of sanctification so that she is perfect. And she's proven to be perfect when she gives birth in the spirit realm. When she gives birth in the spirit realm, that is all the proof she needs for Michael to stand up and throw Satan down. Like I said, people, it hasn't happened yet. But when the perfect comes, all everything will be made known. Okay? But I want you guys to understand this is what the Lord is showing me. She is represented by women. The bride is feminine. She is only a woman. She will only be a woman. Now, I want you to see something else. So here is Solomon. He's married all these women. Now, why would I say that the feminine, the bride is merely feminine? She's only feminine. Because this is what it says here. So, you go to the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is an allegory. Solomon, King Solomon wrote this song. But something is, is different here from reality. He writes this wonderful song about Christ. It's he he's looking into the future. God is giving him this prophetic word about Christ and his church, Christ and his bride. And he's taken he starts out with uh Song of Solomon. He starts out with uh let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for thy love is better than wine. I'm sorry about uh I'm sure you guys out there are kind of glad that you're not the bride of Christ right now because you're thinking, "Oh, get a hug." No, Christ loves you, but he's going to kiss you with a, a brotherly kiss, okay? Don't be worrying and freaking out. This is for the bride. The bride is represented by women. Women will represent the bride. And this is this is what the Lord is showing me. I am so excited about this. And I'm sure that you as men are probably pretty relieved about it, the whole, the whole thing too. Pretty relieved. And so you should be, okay? The bride will be women. She, the women will represent the bride. If you continue to read this passage, it goes on. It's a very beautiful song. I just love this, this whole thing. Now, Revel Song Sol Solomon chapter 6. Let's just skip, skip, to, skip to 6. And it says something very interesting. It talks about the, the temple, pomegranates, her, her temple being like pomegranates. This is where I'm show showing you this. This is where Christ is getting his bride from. He's taking his bride from this church the church of Philadelphia, and he's transcending the bride to, to the, this, this area here. Men, I'm sorry, but you can't transcend here. This is just not going to be up to you. This is not going to be your choice. You just do not, because like Peter, I don't think any of you have actually gotten to the level of Peter. Peter being the premier apostle, none of you have actually transcended Peter. Okay. If Peter couldn't do it, you can't do it either. This is going to be left this last bit is left for this woman, the bride, and she is a feminine spirit. I know it's freaking you out right now. That's okay. I can live with that. I can, <laughs> I can live with the fact that you're, you're freaking out. Okay. The bride are women. Uh, let's read, <clears throat> um, this bride that is, he's, he's, He's having this wonderful experience with this woman. It's a very beautiful, intimate, sexual experience between this woman and himself, the bride and bridegroom. Revel uh, Song of Solomon, chapter six, verse four. Thou art fair, thou art beautiful, my love, as tears are comely as Jerusalem. 
terrible as an army with banner. So she's describing her as Jerusalem. Um, Turn away thy eyes from me, for thou, they have overcome. Thy hair is a flock of go goats, which appear from Gilead. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep, which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. As a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within thy, within thy locks. Your temple. Which look like rubies. Rubies is described as a feminine spirit. Uh, the wisdom. The spirit of wisdom was just in Proverbs, which is also written by Solomon. Wisdom is described as a feminine trait. Okay? It's described as, as pomegranates, as the temple. The same thing there. It's described as wisdom. So pomegranates, think temple, think wisdom. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting. This is where it gets to this. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. What mother? The Holy Spirit. Zion. She is the choice one of that her that bear her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible with an army with banners? Oh, where did we see that before? Oh yeah, Revelation chapter 12. She's got her moon, her feet on the moon, and she's clothed with the sun. And she's got stars on her head. This is the bride. But she's the only one. There's So there's a group of women who, work, who represent the bride. And it's interesting, like I said, there is a there is a there is a there is a contradiction here, if you will, between what happened with Solomon and what's going on happened with Christ Jesus. Now, Solomon, how many wives and princesses did he have? Oh yeah, seven hundred, seven hundred and three hundred concubines. Uh, how many does there mention here? If Solomon wrote this, now why did he get it wrong? Why, if Solomon wrote this, and he did. Why did he get it wrong? Didn't he know how many women are in his own in his own entourage? Obviously, he did. But so he must have been. This is a prophetic word about something that was going to happen. There are three score queens and four score concubines. That's uh, that's not a lot. That's not that's not as many as he had in his entourage. Three score tw scores twenty sixty queens and eighty concubines and virgins without number. Okay. The queens refer to people who are coming from this church, the Church of Philadelphia, those who he's legally married to, and those who are coming from, and the virgins all come from the rest of the, the churches, okay? But there's only one. My dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one that bare her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, they praised her. There is one woman... One woman who will fully, who will be placed, basically, uh, just like Christ is the head of the those who represent uh, masculine energy, if you will, the bridegroom. There will be one woman who will be placed above all the the, the bride. One woman who will represent them all, and this is what it says here. Don't blame me for saying it. I don't care whether you like it or not, because I'm going to say it anyway. One woman, but my dove, my defiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. There is going to be one woman, one, who will represent the bride in fullness. Okay? And I believe she is the one who's spoken about in Revelation chapter 12, who gives birth. Okay, now, whether you like that or not, I'm sorry if you don't like it. Think about it. Pray about it. I'm sure you'll, whether you're, you're able to comprehend it, it could be just that you can't comprehend it, what, what I'm trying to show you here. What I'm trying to show you, what the Lord has been showing to me, that, that the bride is going to be represented by a group of women. He will have women in his entourage. It won't be just men, like 144,000 who follow Christ around. He, They represent masculine energy. They're not the bride. But believe it, but they are the 12 stars. They are the 12 stars that are gracing the head of Christ Jesus, of, of the bride. 
of Revelation chapter 12. They are the 12 stars that represent the ruling judgment, the rulership and the judgment of Christ. That masculine energy. She's got government on her head. She's wearing those crown 12 stars, 12 stars on her head. But she is not the Laodicean church. She is the bride. And but her result of her giving birth opens the, the floodgates of her salvation for the Laodicean church. So she's intimately connected basically to the salvation plan for the Laodicean church, for the synagogue of Satan to be converted. The two are extremely important to each other. If she does not transcend to the agape, she if she does not have that power to transcend above the phileo to the agape, there is no millennial reign. If she can't do it, the, the church of Laodicea can't exist. If she doesn't do it, the, the synagogue of Satan will not find conversion. And those 12, the 12 tribes, the 144,000, they won't find any salvation either because she has to do this in order to throw down the dragon in order for them to have their eyes open to see that they've been naked, poor, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. In order for them to have the strength to resist the mark of the beast. It's all related. It's amazing what the Lord is showing me. There is a woman who gives birth and it will be the son of God's son. It will be the son of the son. He has to prove that he is king and kings, and Lord of lords of every circumstance and situation that mankind has found themselves in. He has to prove that he is the ultimate husband, the ultimate father, the ultimate everything. He has to prove that in order to wear the crown. Every last one of these crowns of the, he starts out with one crown in the beginning. Revelation chapter six, he starts out wearing one crown. And the end of the chapter, he's throwing down Babylon and he's wearing all the crowns. He's given, given them all because he's conquered them all. This is amazing stuff. Anyway, think on it, pray on it, ask the Lord about it. But like I said, I've been living with this for now, 10 years, praying on it, thinking on it, crying about it travail I've gone through over this when this all started for happening people you think it would have been easy oh Lord just said this to me Woo no it wasn't like that people it took me two years to get on YouTube <coughs> when I began to think about it and when I, I, the Lord started showing me this stuff I cried I cried and cried and cried and said Lord I can't tell him that I can't tell him that oh I can't tell him that oh, oh I'll be I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be I'll be told you know, heresy. Oh, oh. And sure enough, I was. <laughs> I was rejected on every level. Right from the time I started on YouTube. Oh, she has too many dreams. She has this. She's a, she's a false prophet. Blah, 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 blah. All the stuff I've had to face. And still face. There's no way God talks to her. <laughs> she's, look at her. She's Look at the way she looks. Look at the way she talks. She can't even talk. She can't even read. She can't do this. You know, she's fat. I don't know. All kinds of stuff. There's no way God talks to her. Why would God even touch her? This is, I, I face the face in the same kind of ridicule, you know, of the synagogue of Satan that uh, most of us have faced. You know, why would God talk to her? She's so imperfect. She's not perfect enough for God to talk to or touch or want or need in his kingdom, in his prophetic ministry. She doesn't make millions of dollars by, you know, standing, you know, standing up in front of thousands of people every day and, you know, like a J Joyce Meyer and all those people. I mean, if it was a Joyce Meyer, I mean, I can understand because I know she's, she's popular. But this woman, she's not popular. Nobody even likes her. No, well, you know, there it is. God sometimes chooses the foolish things in life in order to prove the world is foolish. And what the Lord is showing me is that the bride is represented by an entourage of women who've been chosen by Jesus, I have must choose my bride from what? Among the, the the daughters of men. This is what he told me. And it was so clear. One of the strongest messages he's ever given me, one of the strongest impressions or thoughts that came to me that I could ever recall, keep coming back to me because it was so strong. I must choose my bride from among the daughters of men. The bride of Christ will be re represented by women, women who have transcended the brotherhood to the agape. Sorry, men, you're not part of it. You're not part. You can pray for the bride. Please, please pray for the bride. 
the Lord else obviously has chosen me is to be part of this entourage and I would like very much for you to pray for me because I certainly use your prayers because I'm telling you what the Lord has put me through in the last few years I I, I like I said, the last couple of days I've been saying Lord I can't do this I can't do this this is too hard for me I can't I can't do this I feel like I've been battling with the spirit of death so I really 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 would appreciate your prayers please pray for the bride of Christ <coughs> her transcendent is absolutely vital she is absolutely vital to these last days scenario because if she does not transcend, there is no millennial reign. Okay. Anyway, I think that's all I need to say. It's two hours long. Woohoo! Uh, and I feel like I can still go a little bit further. But I, I'm, I'm really seeing this. I'm seeing it so strong, people. I'm seeing this, and I'm seeing this incredible um, connection between the Laodicean Church and it, their redemption is part of the bride of Christ and her transcension if she does not transcend to the agape to the perfect there is no redemption for the synagogue of Satan there they will never never be able to see so her transcension above the Church of Philadelphia is absolutely vital absolutely vital to bringing the church of Laodicea to the place where they can see, have their eyes opened to receive that eye balm and to receive their white garments in order to have the strength to resist the mark of the beast. Okay, so anyway, I think that's all I need to say. I hope you got something from it. I hope that you've learned something from it. I hope you haven't totally rejected this. And I pray that you pray about it. And I think you guys, like I said, you guys are going to probably be pretty, pretty relieved that you're not the bride. <laughs> okay. I hope, I'm sure that you guys will be extremely relieved, extremely relieved that you are not the bride. Okay. You are part of the brotherhood and you will be taken to the he to, to heaven, to be, uh, um, in the temple to serve God. You, there's the intimacy that in, the, the Church of Philadelphia is given the intimacy of God. They are given the mysteries of God. They are allowed into the temple where God sits and resides, and 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 ask Him things and and delve into mysteries and to serve Him and to know Him in this wonderful, mysterious way that God is allowed. But you are not given the intimacy of the bride, and I think that probably will relieve a lot of you guys out there. But it's given, this is, just like, just like the 144,000 are, are all men, at least the 100, yeah, they're all men. They're all Jewish men. And that's their, their, they follow Jesus everywhere. So they're given that office. Well, guess what? Jesus also has a whole bunch of women who are also in his entourage. And we're equally as important to this whole plan, his salvation plan for the world. So women, be encouraged out there. Be happy that you are being included in this incredible plan and you're not a, just a, you know, kind of, you're part of the entourage too, as women, okay? Be excited. This is exciting stuff. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, there's still time while the church is still here. You still have the opportunity to be part of this whole salvation plan uh, by receiving it. Uh, going to Acts 2.38, Peter, the premier apostle, was given the first um, sermon to give to the world to um, to uh, bring people to repentance when Jesus after Jesus had ascended and Peter was on the day of Pentecost uh, said this on uh, Acts 237 now when they had heard this they were pricked in their hearts and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do and Peter said unto them repent and repent every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children to all that are far off even as many as the Lord God shall call anyway God bless and I will talk to you later